Jeff Grubb has updates about the PlayStation Showcase posted four hours ago. Should we see this? What did Jeff Grubb say? Jeff Grubb, if you're not familiar, Jeff is like a well-known uh, games journalist. He has a lot of sources. He gets a lot of stuff right. Um, so he is somebody to pay attention to because he usually gets stuff right. He doesn't just make stuff up. He has actual sources. Okay. Um, hey, Luke, have you hypothetically played Tears of the Kingdom on PC? Uh, hypothetically, if I were to try it, it would have been before all the patches and stuff were out. So hypothetically, it's possible. But in terms of like actively, no, I don't think I would hypothetically do that. Um, I'm fine with the switch for now, but maybe for subsequent playthrough, I could see hypothetically doing that. But as of right now, hypothetically, no. What are the odds of getting a Jordan or Jor Raptor, um, Luke and Maddie podcast? I think we could probably get Maddie on as a guest. I think we could do that uh, for sure. Maddie has like two or three podcasts already, so he probably doesn't want to jump on another one full time. But um, as a guest, I think he definitely would come out. Okay, let's see this from from the one and only Jeff Grubb. Let's do this. I'm Jeff Grubb, and this is my Game Mess channel. Uh, I want to do more of these videos where I kind of talk about what people are talking about in games, especially when they have anxieties and they're not, not exactly sure about the future of something i feel like if i have some insights i'd like to come on here and, and talk them out and talk through them with people uh, and i think it's clear what people are having anxieties about this week and it's the future of playstation and i, I boy i think a lot of that is, is really overblown although i understand where it's coming from some of it's coming from some mischaracterizations of st stuff that sony has said uh to investors some of it feels like it's a gut feeling based on kind of the direction the company's headed and what they showed at that PlayStation Showcase. And I get all that. I, I'm completely, I completely sympathize with people who are worried about the future. And there, there almost certainly is something to those concerns. It's, it's just not as drastic as most people are making it out to be. There are some key issues, and I am going to write that down so I don't forget as it like occurs to me, like, what's a key issue? This is how I make the videos, by the way. Ideas pop in my head. Let's type it down right Real now. Real time. Uh, making sequels is harder than ever. We'll get to that in a little bit. A little teaser for you. So where does this really start, though? Uh, this I miss his long hair. I'm going to be real. I miss his long hair. He used to have, like, long flowing locks, and he got a haircut. It's not the same. Starts from this little... Jeff Krubhub. <laughs> Why you got to do him like that? <laughs> um, That's funny. Uh, you should have Mudahar on as a guest, too, Luke. He was recently on a chat with Vaush, which was super weird to see. Oh, yeah, what did he talk about with Vaush? Was, did he talk about... Was it the phase stuff, or... I feel like I saw a thumbnail for that. I didn't watch it, but there was something like that. I think. I think so. That that rings a bell. I don't know. I don't know. Um. I didn't watch it. Just a weird crossover. Okay. Yeah. I I don't know. I could I could ask him. I could ask him. We're working on something for the Yakuza series, so little tidbit there we'll see what that turns into little chart here where people are are reading this and a lot of people are reading it correctly uh but a lot of the headlines said that by t fiscal year 2025 sony playstation is going to begin investing 60 percent of its video gaming development budget into live service games so therefore the other 40 percent will be pr you know it's traditional games that's actually how sony puts it now that means on the face of it sony will be spending more money on live service games than on traditional games if you look at the chart a little closer though you can kind of see like this isn't too much of a real concern because they are, and this, you know, this this bar graph that we're looking at scales this way. Uh, that bar graph is growing overall, and you can see that compared to fiscal year 2023, they're going to be spending more money. That light blue is bigger than the year before. Well, then not the year before. It's fiscal 25 versus fiscal 2023, 20, but you can see that it's growing. It's just not growing as fast as the live service bar. If you want to like go back to fiscal year 19, you could see that it's about even with the investment there. But they've had a lot of really great games since fiscal year 19, so you can kind of expect the same pace of big single player games from PlayStation just based on this chart alone. Also, boy, it just makes sense that they're gonna keep doing that. You, you kind of know they're going to do that. They know that's what gets people into the door. They're just making these bigger bets that, well, not even bigger bets. They're making a lot of smaller bets, not much smaller, but smaller, that one of these live service games, maybe two if they're lucky, are gonna hit and they're gonna hit big. And they're not gonna be, you know, a game that makes a billion dollars in revenue. They're gonna be games that make $10 billion of revenue over the next 10 years. And that yeah. is definitely something that they want. And this is the thing, like PlayStation so far has had, love it or hate it, a somewhat antiquated view of building out their gaming portfolio. Most of the big companies like EA, like Ubisoft, like Activision, like Take Two, the reason they're big companies and continue to grow bigger is because um, 
it's because they have these live service games that just print money and love it or hate it live service games make a hell of a lot more money than single player games do people will point at like oh did you see that elden ring has made over a billion dollars and i'm like yeah that's great you know how much money call of duty makes do you know how much money gta online makes do you do you know how much money like rainbow six siege makes like these games are massive massive and so you can have the best game of the year best game of the last few years and it still pales in comparison to what a game like fifa or madden or or call of duty does on an annual basis okay so sony's whole goal is to create a portfolio not just of the big bangers that game, get game of the year and do really well that way but also games that have long-term uh support and you can see like digital full game sales you can see in terms of these uh pricing estimations you can see that they're actually expecting people to start spending less and less as a total compared to the amount that they start leaning into add-on content so they're projecting that people will start to um spend more money on fewer games effectively and lean into carefully selecting a few games and doing that a lot now this might end up being true it might also end up being just a mischaracterization or a misunderstanding of the client base you guys remember back in like 2014 2015 all the news was about how consoles were dying all of gaming was moving to mobile devices diablo immortal is what every big game would turn into all these games were only going to be on mobile from then on and that didn't end up happening it just didn't end up being the the reality so sometimes it these projections are real and accurate sometimes they're not but so is that i mean is this a concern is this a problem uh yes and no the, the yes is that well clearly if you work at sony or you want to get acquired by sony it does maybe behoove you to bring them a live service game that's where a lot of the money is going to go if you are if you're coming up with a new idea for real disco cobra 2013 super chatted ten dollars Thank you, Disco. I can see why Sony or Microsoft <coughs> might want to focus on live service. Mm -hmm. I just don't want it to take away from good single-player content. They want their GTA Online of COD-style game. Yes. Yes. I agree. As long as it doesn't take away from the single-player stuff, we're probably good. Uh, the question just becomes, at some point, do companies like Rockstar, do they start to ask, well, if we're only making the money from GTA Online, why bother with the single-player stuff? And so far, they've still done the single player stuff. They still come out with Red Dead Redemption 2, even though they kind of abandoned um, the online component because it wasn't making the money they were hoping for. But my concern is eventually, do these companies just say, eh, the single player stuff, we're good. We'll just start focusing on the multiplayer stuff. That, that would be lame. And as of right now, there's no indication they're doing that. You can see they still project to spend a ton of money on single player stuff, traditional games. But it is a concern. Like, at what point do they make that decision? Um, because all of these big companies like EA and Activision and take two, they've started to make those decisions, which blows for real. Um, let's see. Also, again, thank you for the 10. That's very generous. Thank you. Now, I, I think that works backwards from the reality a little bit though. And this, this is the real key point. That number uh, that they're investing in traditional games isn't remaining stagnant because Sony's like, well, we, we're gonna make, we're ju we just wanna make bets on live service games. If they could, they would spend more money on traditional games. They just don't believe that there is any real opportunity to do so. What do I mean by that? They are already putting the maximum amount of money that they can into studios like Naughty Dog and Insomniac and Sucker Punch to get great games out of those studios. And you can't just spin up another one of those studios. Those are development teams that have been honed over a long period of time. And, you know, Sony does try to bring some of those, those other studios up to that level. They're, they're trying that with Housemark. They previously tried it with Bend. But I think that's a, a evidence of it not working out necessarily where, you know. This is absolutely true. And another great example of it not working is Ubisoft. I mean, Ubisoft has thousands. Don't they have like 15,000 employees or something? They have a, a, a just insane number of people that work at Ubisoft. And they have Ubisoft, you know, uh, Singapore. They have Ubisoft, um, Montreal, Ubisoft, Quebec, Ubisoft, like all of these, Ubisoft Paris. They have all of these different studios all around the world. Is it up to 20K now? Yeah, 20,000 employees. Um, and some of those studios do really good work. Others are just like support studios. Others 
create stuff like Skull and Bones, which has been in development for like a decade and has no end in sight. So you can spend more, but it doesn't actually necessarily get you anything. You can just keep pumping money, hiring more and more people, but creating a team, a, a group of people that works well together is not as easy as just throwing money at the problem. It's not that simple. And so I, I understand what he's saying. Like, yeah, I mean, there's not that much money, uh, that much more money that could be spent on this type of thing. Um, it's just not that simple. And so I, I can see that. Um Still, I find it hard to believe that they wouldn't want to significantly grow their total investment, either with with a, a expansions into new studios, like building a second team for Naughty Dog to work on uh, different projects supervised by the same management or something like that. But you know what? I don't have specifics on how this breaks down, how this 40% breaks down. Maybe there is a clear breakdown to be had, but they seem confident that they don't need to spend significantly more money. Yeah. Amazon is the perfect money. Doesn't make a, or it doesn't mean a good game example. Yeah. Now Amazon tried throwing lots of money at their games and it hasn't really worked out. You know, we were trying to make Ben to the next Naughty Dog or the next Insomniac. And we made a big bet on them with days gone and it didn't pan out. So if they could, they, they would love to have 10 Last of Us quality caliber games coming out at any one time. That would be that would be great for them. They just don't know. That's $200 million is a lot to put on a game when, when you're not sure the development team can actually execute on the parameters of, of that project. So why does that make live service more compelling? Well, listen, live services is a, got a pro problems of its own. There's no guarantees for success. In fact, you're almost guaranteed to fail. But it is more affordable to make a live service game or at least get one off the ground or see if it's a good idea than it is to do that with a big $200 million first party single player campaign driven Sony PlayStation game. Those are the most expensive games that there are for the most part uh, outside of like these long running like Destiny style games or, you know, or boondongles, 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 boondongles like, uh, like Halo Infinite or something like that. So they're going to make a lot of bets on live service games. And that is maybe that maybe flips us back to, OK, so they're, they're not. And I think this is one of the reasons people have gotten concerned, because what did we see during the PlayStation showcase? We saw a lot of upcoming extraction shooters. According to some sources, the Last of Us multiplayer game is a hybrid extraction shooter with narrative elements. And so a lot of people were like, what are they doing? All of these multiplayer games they're working on, these live service titles, they all seem to be targeting the same player base, people who like extraction-based shooters. Um, seems weird that they would just create like five games all trying to grab the same 10 people or same 100,000 people or million people, whatever. And I, I think it is just like they've seen that out of all of these projects that people put together, they just like four of them flop and one turns into a hit and you just got to get lucky and market it right. And it's got to be a good game. And there's a lot of things that have to go right. And you have to be a little lucky too. So they're just going to throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And it's a very different philosophy than what PlayStation has had previously, which is we're going to spend four or five years working on this crazy, huge single player game. And then we're going to release it when it's ready. And it's going to be amazing. So it's just different. It's just different. Um, let's see. Uh, Luke, did they ask the last was multiplayer then? No, what they did is they sh like took most of the people off of the game, moved them over to another team, presumably that's working on the next single player game that Naughty Dog is making with Neil Druckmann at the helm. And they have a very small group of people still kind of working on it, doing stuff in it. We don't know what they're doing, but still working on it. And at some point they will probably bring more people over to continue working on it or revamp it or something, or they'll just cancel it. It's not really clear. I can't imagine they walk away after like three, four years of development on it and just say, oh, well, but maybe it's that bad. I don't know. It was apparently bad enough that they decided not to even show a smidgen of it. They just decided to keep it secret, take the team off of it and like, they, they just were like, okay, this is, if we, it gets to see the light of day, it's probably going to be very different than what it is right now, which is, which is interesting. We're not making these big, a lot more bets on single player games because the, the studios just aren't there to do that. And that's where I'm like, I want to stress, like if they could, they would, 
but they, they believe they just can't. And so they are trying to eye the best opportunity for them to do something with the more money that they're making. You could see the money that they're putting into the games is growing. It's you know, fiscal year 19, it's this, it's, it's this little thing, and then you get to be this little big when, you're, when it's fiscal year 23, and then it's growing massively by fiscal year 2025. They want to be putting more money into games. They just don't think they're going to be able to accomplish any sort of return on investment that's worthwhile to them with traditional games. Now, that is maybe where people are still going to be. There's a cause for concern. You can look at the rest of this chart. Or, I'm sorry, this chart, this, this financial report from Sony. Uh, we could see... Let's see, life to date. These are the things that Sony cares about. This is the thing that all these companies care about, but Sony's just putting it out there. Uh, life to date spending per console. It's way up on the PS5 versus the PS4. This is what they care about. This is what matters to them. This is because, yeah, sure, you, you, bought, a, you bought a PlayStation for God of War. You bought a... Yeah, isn't this interesting? So for PS4, during the same time period of the generation, so from launch in 2013 through 2016 versus launch of November 2020 for PS5 through March of 23. The average spend per connected device down 10% for full game purchases. People are spending less money on games on PS5 for just the game than they did on PS4 during the same period of time per console, which to me actually makes sense because I feel like there haven't been that many, at least it doesn't feel, uh, the perception is that there haven't been as many like big PlayStation 4 releases. Uh, coming to justify big expense uh, purchases for full price titles. But I mean, honestly, that might just be the perception as a count. There might be more. I don't know. But it feels like we've had a lot more cross generational ones than we had back in like 2015, 2016, which is interesting. Um, Add on spending is up 210%. 210%. That's crazy. The prices too. Well, I would say I, I, I know that the the ten dollar difference between sixty and seventy bucks makes a big difference. I don't think the price rising from sixty to seventy dollars is that big of a turnoff to justify a ten percent drop. I think it's more like macroeconomic factors, people not wanting to spend uh, a huge chunk of of money. Um, for that, but also if you look at like, I don't know if these numbers are adjusted for inflation or not, but in terms of inflation, 70 bucks in 2023 is worth roughly equivalent to $60 in November of 2013. So it, it, it just gets kind of messy once you start factoring all of that in, but subscription as a total percentage of console spending is up 52% accessories. People are spending 60% more on accessories. That's crazy. So more controllers, I I guess. Controllers, headsets, that type of thing. And I'll give them credit. Like, they've been trying. They've got the DualSense Edge. They've got some of these more... Um, these higher-end accessories and stuff. So that's good. I'm still shocked they haven't done custom panels and stuff for game releases. Like a custom Spider-Man PlayStation 5. That seems like a layup. Easy money. But... The point is, people are spending more money on, on individual consoles than they did during the same time period in the last generation, which is wild. It's wild. PlayStation for Demon Souls and Ratchet and & Clank and, and whatever else, and the promise of a Ghost of Tsushima sequel, all that. Yeah, you bought all that stuff, but so did all your friends, and your friends are probably hopping into other games as well. Maybe you're not a multiplayer gamer, but your friends are always going on and on playing this multiplayer game or that multiplayer game, this live service game. If, if your friends are there and they're playing something, boy, that might suck you in. And that network effect is very powerful. And you can see it's already having a huge effect on PS5's life to date spend per console. They're making a lot more money per user than they were before. And that's due to subscriptions. Uh, you can see that that uh, plus 52%, accessories up 60%, uh, add on software, add on stuff, 210% increase. That's microtransactions. It's DLC, but it's microtransactions. That's huge. So they spotted a potential, sorry, am I getting chimes over here? They spotted a potential, like, huge growth opportunity. And that's also what's driving this. Yeah, sure. Making these games is hard. I, I tease, like, making sequels is hard. And maybe that's where we do flip back to, okay, there's some concern to be had. And why do I say that? Just think about it. They made God of War, and they made God of War Ragnarok, and now they're ready to reboot. And I made a video about this before. We have, you know, these two massive, big, expensive games, pretty similar to one another. Nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm playing and loving Tears of the Kingdom right now, and that's the same goddamn map. Nothing wrong with that. But they know that they could get away with that for two games. The third game, likely, possibly, maybe not likely, possibly, they might be seeing a um, diminishing returns on that investment. And then the fourth game is like, well, people get kind of sick of it. Some people get sick of it. Reviewers start like docking points because it's the same thing over and over again. This is where a lot of Sony properties are at right now. You saw it at the showcase with Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2. That looks great. 
It's, it's Spider-Man 2. We know we're going to love that. That's that first game. is That's the PlayStation 4 game I can go back to and have a great time right now without question. And yet, we saw that showcase, and a lot of people are like, yeah, it's Spider-Man. We get it. That's not going to hurt Spider-Man 2. That's a really good point. I hadn't really thought about this. So his point is that some of these franchises, a lot of them actually, are enough into their franchise life cycle that now people are frankly expecting something different and that requires reinvention and reinvention is really expensive and also risky because i mean you think about the transition of god of war uh 2018 off of god of war from like 20 whatever the last one was 2013 or 12 or whatever uh big difference big difference and even though now it's like yeah of course it was received well it was awesome they didn't know that when they were making it they didn't know how it would be received so because of that it's it's an in interesting to think of that now they're at this point where they're like yeah we just need more time to work on these sequels and these updates and things because we need to be more transformational we can't just do god of boy 3.2 and then like shift it around where it's god of war ragnarok but this time you play more as atreus and you can ride monsters and it's open world completely and you also have a spaceship like they can add stuff but it still feels the same and with spider-man the unique thing about spider-man is that they of course had spider-man the original game they also released spider-man remastered and then they also did spider-man miles morales and all of these are close to the same game i mean i i thought miles morales was a fun foray into something else um you know different playable character different setting di or not different setting but different time of year so like it at least looks a little different so there were tweaks but it was i, I mean it's very very similar to the first spider-man game I mean, let's be completely honest it's very very similar very similar and so by the time we're getting spider-man 2 it's like yeah this feels like the god of war ragnarok to god of war 2018 it feels like yeah it's cranking the knobs up again but I think by the end of Spider-Man uh, 2, it's probably going to start to feel a little like, okay, they need to they need to reevaluate. It was like a DLC. Yeah, yeah, but they spun it off into its own thing, and I think they charged 40 bucks for it, I think, is how much it was. I, I'm pretty sure. I feel like you can get uh, get away with it for two games, but three feels too much. I think so. I, and it'll still review pretty well, I'm sure. But, like, imagine if Nintendo comes out and it's like, yeah, the next Zelda game is also going to be on the Switch. And it's also going to look just like Breath of the Wild. And it's going to... um, It's going to... Like, maybe this time we're going to have an alternative dimension. And we're going to have big boss fights and we revamp the combat system. Like, it'll be cool, it'll be more, but it's not going to be significantly different. And I don't think it would be enough to justify them sort of rehashing the same broad skeleton, you know? So it's a really interesting point. I hadn't really thought of this before. But yeah, a lot of PlayStation's biggest franchises are kind of at that point. Uncharted, the reason Naughty Dog's moving on is because they reached that point. The Last of Us reached that point. So both of like Naughty Dog's big franchises have hit this point where they kind of need to let it sit. They need to reevaluate, figure out if they can reinvent it or something. Um, and they need to do something more significant. Same with God of War. Like it's, it's not as simple as just make God of War 3. Like just figure it out. I, I would say like, yeah, just bring it to Egypt and like let us fight egyptian gods but i think you got to find a way to to get the narrative compelling enough to do it so it's gonna be really really interesting yeah assassin's creed reached that point passed it and now they're going back to the beginning yeah well they passed they reached that point around like assassin's creed honestly probably syndicate is when people started to get really sick of the annual releases and they're like okay god let's calm down please jesus and so then they reevaluate it and they came out with Origins. And then Odyssey was like, wow, this is Origins, but way bigger and crazier. And then Valaha came out and everybody's like, oh, so it's it's just the same thing, but like kind of worse. They didn't even really improve it. And so now they're reinventing and they're re 
figuring everything out. You know, it's, it's, I think he's right. I think he's right. Uh, they have a lot of franchises that need reinvention and reboots, if you want to use that term. And it's all lining up around the same time. It might start to hurt Spider-Man 3. I know this is kind of a Spider-Man 3-ish because of Miles Morales, but no, people are still ready to go for this series. So a lot of Sony properties are sort of in this zone. Now, Ghost of Tsushima, this is why Ghost of Tsushima is so important because that's proving that they can keep making new things that are going to shoot into that, that, that stratosphere of success, and they want more of those. But they might, I mean, man, if like these, these games start going bad as they, as they come in, going bad. Now, sorry, interrupted by a kid. Uh, <laughs> it's so relatable. Did you hear that? You can hear his kid yelling in the background and then he has to pause recording and he loses his train of thought. <laughs> Dude, it's so relatable. So relatable. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but the whole stream, like you can hear Lachlan running around upstairs and you'll just hear a little like, as he's running across and dancing and stuff. It's so funny to me. I love it. Uh, none of this is to say that any of the future PlayStation single player games are going to be bad. Uh, they're not going to be. They know how to make them. They're going to deliver them. They're going to be just fine. But they will probably, or again, possibly, see that diminishing returns on investment. And I think Sony knows that. And they're a little bit worried about it. Because how do you reload every single time with something that is equal to or bigger than Spider-Man? That's not going to happen. Um, I think what Sony is like maybe going to try to feel out here is, can they do what Nintendo has done with its franchises, where when it really comes down to time to innovate, time to do something new, they do so, and it grows the audience even bigger. I'm sure Sony is eyeballing that and seeing if they can pull it off, but traditionally, they've not done this. They have done a handful of games, sometimes a lot of games in a franchise from one studio, and then as that gets sort of played out, like, all right, you're moving on. We, you know, uh, going from Resistance to Spider-Man or whatever, going Kill Zone or whatever they were doing before Kill Zone, now they're doing Horizon, and all the, a lot of these studios had games going way back before that as well. I mean, how many PlayStation 1 franchises does Sony still have going around? How many PlayStation 2 franchises does Sony still have actively in production with a new game? I mean, Ratchet and Clank got one. There's, there's a handful. There's some. But for the most part, Sony's strategy is let's let's get as much as we, as, as we can out of this, and then the next time around, we're, you know, we're going to do something new, and, and maybe it'll probably be bigger. And usually they've been right about that. It's a completely... And this is what I think was so baffling about the showcase is that Sony has shown that they understand the power of exciting new stuff. It's simple, but <laughs> apparently it's not like a given. If you have something that's new and that looks really good, people will be excited and they will buy it. And a lot of people will buy it, especially if it's something that gets people excited a lot. And everybody starts talking about it. Maybe that's because graphically it looks great or in terms of the animation quality, it looks amazing. Or it's from a team that everybody remembers doing really great work. There can be all of these other little pieces to the puzzle that add to it, but people like new stuff that excites them. And as much as people say like, oh, we want Bloodborne 2, we want this. Maybe it's as simple as just like for Bloodborne, they're saying, listen, we have a vision for it, but it's going to take some time and we want to like do Elden Ring, but with Bloodborne, like a Bloodborne coat of paint version of Elden Ring. M maybe that's what they want to do. And they're just like, that's going to take a little while. Uh, so bear with us. I still think that like a trailer just announcing it would be an easy layup for community points. But, you know, I'm sure they have their reasons to do it. But um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be really, really interesting to see how they navigate the next few years, especially putting so much effort into live service games, because I think we're going to see a lot of people that are just kind of like, this isn't the Sony that I know and love. The Sony I know and love focuses a lot on single player games. Why are they like, why is the, the centerpiece game for this showcase a live service game? That sucks. And the live service fans will be all about it. And the single player fans will hate it. Just like when we watch the game awards, people are getting pissed that there's like mobile games mixed in. And listen, I'm not a mobile gamer, but there are people that while watching the game awards are like, oh my God, they announced Candy Crush 2, uh, The Reckoning. I don't I don't know Candy Crush. I have no idea. But there are people to whom that appeals. And I think Sony's just trying to grow the tent at this point. Really viable strategy because they've been right. But they are getting to a point where it's like, does it get bigger, bigger than Spider-Man? Does it get bigger than God of War? Uh, God of War, obviously, they're not going to give up on that. That's going to have a, a sequel that's going to probably try to reboot. Uh, do I think Ubisoft will show us more gameplay of AC Mirage on UB Forward? Yeah, I can't go into details, but yes, they will. Yes. We'll see a lot more. Yes. Things in some ways, uh, maybe expand some things in some key ways. They, they are on the next-gen systems now, They're the new-gen systems. They can do some new stuff. There's a lot of promise there, but it's really, really hard. This is the key. These sequels are going to happen new franchises, new IP from these studios that have made, made a franchise that we loved before, that's going to happen. 
but it's all very difficult, a high degree of difficulty, and the return on that investment, while high, the, there's a ceiling. And so they go back to live service. And we all know this. I'm, now I'm just saying stuff that everyone fully understands. Um, so the, really the illuminating stuff I wanted to bring here is kind of, it. yeah, I get why people are concerned. You, 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 there is something to it. But if you've been happy with the cadence and the output of PlayStation's first party single player game so far, I mean, we can go back there. We can go back there right, right now. Let's scroll there. The bar is as big as it's ever been. You know, it's, it's the same size as it was in fiscal year 19, and it's big, bigger than it was in fiscal year 23. So broader point is he just doesn't expect them to be able... Sorry, sorry, Jeff. And if I, they could find I didn't mean to do you dirty like that. Um, his point is that they just can't find ways to realistically spend more money than they are or have spent in years past. So they just don't really know what to do. And so they're investing into live service. I get that. I understand it. Um, doesn't mean people have to like it. And I mean, this again is built on the assumption that they just aren't seeing a return on investment when they go and they spend more than this. So they found that this is just a good amount for them to spend. And, you know, it, it's clear. You can take really good teams. You can give them a check to work on a game. And then they put something out like Redfall, you know, it's like that team should be capable of putting out something really cool. And they failed. They had the money. They seemingly had the time because they delayed it and yet they failed. So it's not always as simple as just write a bigger check. And it's why I've expressed previously concern with like Microsoft's approach to some of these um, games and studios where sure they have money, they have more money than they know what to do with but they haven't demonstrated uh, an ability to actually turn that into results, you know? And that's what worries me. I've been saying for a while, games need to scale back to what it was um, in the P PS2 era. Taking eight years to make a game is too long and fall is, and the fall is too big if it fails. That's something, I, who are we talking to? We were talking to somebody Oh man, it's going to kill me. I, who was it? Um, I don't know. We were talking to someone. I don't think it was on stream. Maybe it was just a conversation I was having, but oh man, it's going to fry my brain. I was talking to somebody and we were, we were going through uh, like game development budgets and stuff. And I, I, I asked him like, realistically, where's the time being lost? Like, why is it that games take so much longer now? We see these like, demos of what like we've seen what some of these engines can do and it's crazy how streamlined they can make a lot of this stuff become like with the metahumans or what unreal engine can do with like the dynamic placement of animations and rigs and stuff like this texturing stuff what they're showing in this is just outrageous and so i'm looking at it and i'm wondering from the consumer side if things are this quote unquote easy to do now because the engines can get so powerful. Why does it take developers five, six years to put a game together where it's like 10 hours of this and then some exploration and then some other stuff. If the engines are that powerful, like what is, what am I missing? And basically what he said is he thought a lot of it came down to mismanagement to unrealistic production schedules and and uh, unrealistic scope. So they spend a lot of time developing stuff that ends up getting cut and doesn't work. And so there's that. Um, yeah, the Nanite system's insane. Yeah. Everything is miscommunication and mismanagement. Well, and that's what makes from software. Yeah, this is that Nanite system. Um, the bit rate of the video is like, oh my God, stop it. <laughs> so many little dots. This is a nightmare for video encoding right now. This is like actual hell on earth. Little bitty pixel size, different colors. This is like, <laughs> this is a streamer's worst nightmare. Um, however, I like, it's what makes from software so exceptional is that they seem to be just a really lean mean game dev machine yes there have been rumors and uh discussions about crunch and things like that but all of this like they've demonstrated that they're able to just pump out pretty high quality titles let's just say uh <laughs> some would say pretty good games they've been able to put out 
phenomenal titles very quickly, like surprisingly quickly. And it's because I, in my opinion, they know what they're doing. And they're like, this is the game. Hidetaka Miyazaki is like, yeah, this is the vision. They plan it out and they're like, this is the game. We're going to do this. And then they work on it and they make it happen. And it's amazing when it does uh, come out. It's just tremendous. Um, there's questions regarding optimization too. Unreal might be difficult to optimize for devs. It certainly seems like it. What I had, uh, what was explained to me was for Unreal Engine, because I, I we were going to do a video with this guy and I, I'm not sure if it's going to happen just frankly, because he was, he was interesting to talk to, but as you guys can imagine, I'm sure some game devs are not great, like on camera or speaking and clearly communicating what they're trying to say. So my idea was to get a, a Unreal Engine game developer on, and we were going to do kind of a conversational thing, breaking down why we've seen so many Unreal Engine games launch so totally broken. Um, so I guess I could summarize it, but Anyway, effectively what he was saying is that there's issues with like the blueprint system where basically in Unreal Engine, you can have these sort of like hybrid scripts that do a lot of code for you that make game dev super fast and easy. So you can get stuff done really quick, but they're really inefficient, especially on PC, uh, because a lot of people will try to play these games on lower end hardware while you're developing the game on a supercomputer, right? So what they'll do is they'll then go back in and they'll try to recode the thing by hand but they only realize how difficult that's going to be towards the end of development because you only start to really worry about optimization towards the end. So they're like, okay, well, now we got to polish it because we got the game coming out in, in six months or three months or whatever. So they go back in, they try to rewrite the blueprint code to make it run more efficiently. And they realize that that creates a hundred different issues. And so it just causes a lot of problems. Um, but that was one thing. And then the other piece, he said, Unreal Engine 4 just has a lot of weird quirks to it. And there's a reason why companies like Rocksteady rewrote entire chunks of the engine code because they just wanted to get it working better and more efficiently, which is why Unreal, yeah, it was Unreal Engine 3 was what Arkham Knight ran in. And Arkham Knight, I still insist, looks way better than most games we're getting now. It's insane how gorgeous that game is. Animation quality, texture quality, post-processing effects, everything. It's outrageous.